stretch out your hands. Stretch out your hands this morning. Oh, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Whatever you're believing for this morning, break through this morning. It's in the stretch. So stretch out to Him this morning. You are worthy, Lord God. You are worthy, Lord Jesus. You are Rafa, our healer, Jehovah Jireh, our provider. This morning, Lord God, we stretch out. We stretch out in faith this morning to you, Lord. We stretch out in faith to you this morning, Lord. Jesus, Jesus, we worship you. We're going to sing his name. We're going to cry out to Yahweh this morning. We're going to cry out to Yahweh. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. We're going to cry out to Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh. He will meet your need this morning, church. Stretch out to him this morning. Let's worship. Jesus. is a lamp, a, a lamp to my, my life. You light up my path. And so if that's you this morning, you're needing direction this morning, know that Jesus Christ is the living word. And a relationship with him this morning will light your way. So stretch out one more time this morning. One more time this morning as an act of surrender. Jesus, we surrender to you this morning. atmosphere of worship, we're going to take up our offering this morning. So if I can call up the ushers and just stay in that place, stay in that place of worship. Open up your heart to Him. Even as you give this morning, give wholeheartedly to Him. You deserve our very best, Lord God. You deserve our very best in everything, even our finances this morning. We give to you wholeheartedly. So as we go into worship, why don't you give this morning? As our ushers come through, Father God, we pray, Lord. We pray that you bless every person that's sown in this morning. We bless our offering this morning, Lord God. We give it wholeheartedly, Lord God, that it will advance your kingdom this morning. It will advance your kingdom in our community. It will advance, Father God, your kingdom here on earth. Let your kingdom manifest, Father God. We give to you this morning in Jesus' name. And everyone says, come on, everyone says, amen. 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 Why don't you turn around and say good morning? Talofa, kia ora, kia ora, kamosta, 
Turn around and bless somebody this morning. Hey, why don't you take your seat this morning? We're so glad that you're here. Yes, we are. Welcome. Welcome, church. So good to have you in the house. Welcome to our online congregation. So good that you logged in this morning. Well, yeah, so glad that you tuned in this morning. Fantastic. Hey, if you, where's our visitor team? We've got our visitor team here. I can see Aroha. I can see Doc. I can see Javon here. If you are visiting with us this morning, why don't you give us a wave? We want to welcome you. We've got a team. We've got a gift for you. I can see this one over here. There's a visitor over here in the green. Welcome. There's another one over here in the black. Welcome. Come on, let's give them a welcome, church. There's another one over here. There's more over the back, Javon. I want to welcome you this morning. We're so glad that you're here with us. If you are visiting with us and you were too shy to put your hand up, we would still love to meet you, wouldn't we? That's How right. can they do that? The cafe after the, the cafe s- after church. We are welcome team. More than happy to pay your coffee, ice cream. We've got ice cream on tap all night, actually. Fantastic. I mean, all day. All day. All day. All day. Just all day. Also, if you have a birthday or an anniversary this week, wedding anniversary, a birthday, give us a wave. No, none. Can you see any? I can see one here, James. James. James's birthday, and somebody's Aaron. saying there's oh. one over here. Tom, is that you? Yes, Happy it's birthday, Tom. Tom. Anyone behind me? Any wedding anniversaries? Louise. Louise. Anniversary, birthday. Birthday. Happy birthday, Louise. And uh, we want to welcome up, back. Want to welcome back Noel and Peter from their honeymoon. Yeah. Good to have you guys back in the house. Hey, why don't you turn your eyes to the screen this morning? And we want to let you know the things that are coming up. I just deleted all my notes. So, can you put the first screen up and I'll talk to it? Okay, we want to let you know that our clothes party was unreal. And uh, so many people came from the community. We were raising money to support the Acorn Project, which is uh, supporting kids and their families with cancer. And we raised, church, we raised over $2,000 wow. for them. Amazing, eh? It proves that women love to shop, right? I don't, uh, Connect Group's are uh, not on this week, so that is not the one. But we've got an amazing media team, but this is on on Friday night. And so you needed to have registered already. And if you haven't, the question is why not? And uh, if you haven't, come and talk to Pastor Dave after the service, and he will let you know if there's any seats available. It's going to be a phenomenal night. Also this morning, we've got Boost On. That is for our intermediate years, age seven and eight. They are having a wild time already up there in one of the rooms up there now. If your intermediate age young person is sitting in the church in the service and they'd like to go, you can... uh, Leanne, can you give us a wave? This is Leanne at the back, and she will help direct your young people to her. Fantastic. Have we got, I'm sure we've got some more notices. I know we do. That's right. This is really exciting. Not tomorrow night, but the following Monday night, we've got our info evening with Bethlehem College and uh, the course tutors. There's three of them coming down. They're going to come and outline the courses for early childhood diploma and for the diploma in primary school teaching. You do not need to sign up on the night. This is an info evening, but we do need to know how many are coming. Okay, so please get your info into the Ask Me desk. And we have Shane Willard. Now, if you've never, how many have heard Shane before? Shane is from America, a lot of you. If you haven't, he will change your life. You will be shifted. What you thought the word said, you will be enlightened, you'll be deepened, and you'll be challenged. So put these dates in your diary. It's two weeks away. We're going to watch a quick clip from him. And, uh, and then we're going to welcome Apostle Mike, who is coming to bring the word this morning. Amen. The Bible is not a static record of God. The Bible is a dynamic, progressive, moving revelation of what people thought God was, leading to the final revelation of God in the risen Christ. Although he will perfect you, he will never harm you, for the bush was not consumed. Their understanding of God got closer and closer and closer and closer. God revealed in Jesus Christ acted first so that we would see just how far God loved us since before the foundation of the world. 
The God revealed in Christ is closer than we ever imagined. The God revealed in Christ is actually willing to engage the brokenness of our story. For don't you know, God is like Jesus, exactly like Jesus. God had always been like Jesus. May we present the Word of God in a way that is beautiful, progressive, moving. And may we be so profoundly connected to Jesus so that the world around us can see our lives before them as an ultimate testimony and witness to what happened before the foundation of the world at the culmination of the ages. Grace and peace. Jesus a clap. Let's just stand and honor Jesus. He's the center of our story. We give him preeminence today. Jesus, we honor you. Come on, let's clap to him. Come on, do your best. One, two, three. Hallelujah, Lord, we honor you. We lift your name and we thank you. You are the best. Amen. Give someone a high five. Please be seated. I want to uh, just show a couple of uh, photos and clips uh, that come from Uganda. How many know we've been involved in Uganda? Let me just share how that happened. I was at a pastor's conference, and uh, I came out during the break, having a cup of coffee, saw a very black man digging the garden, doing the gardening. I said, oh, hello, who are you, and where do you come from? And he introduced himself, and turns out he's from Uganda. And I said, well, what brings you to New Zealand? And he said, well, God spoke to me in Uganda that he was going to provide for me to come to New Zealand. And, and I, I said, well, that's amazing. How long did it take between God speaking to you and then you got here? And he said, oh, well, that was uh, about six months. I told everything, God's taken me to New Zealand. I packed my bag and told him I'll unpack it when I get to New Zealand. And that was six months. And uh, I said, well, why have you come here? And he said, well, God told me he'd connect me to someone pastors here. And, and uh, that's all I know. The moment he said that, I felt that's me. And so we invited him home and I got to know him, got to connect with him and uh, we heard a story and uh, then uh, two of our our leaders in the church, Bride and Nisbet and Andy Mason, uh, went over to Uganda and uh, did an exploratory outreach there. And then uh, over a period of time, we have helped them. And so uh, we set up a Bible school there. We had some, my wife and some of the ladies over 60 went there on a missions trip and set up a Bible school. And uh, we bought, and as they were a bit of a kind of a, wow, you know, we don't have people live that long, you know, because people die of AIDS. And so it was quite something to have older people just go there and minister the Word of God and then set up a Bible school. From that Bible school, there's now been 300 churches planted in Uganda and Kenya and uh, and up in Sudan. And then uh, we also helped John uh, buy a piece of land and get a foundation for a church building. And, uh, and over time, the church building's come up. It's the biggest church building in the area. And uh, more recently, um, we've helped him uh, establish a house. And uh, Joe and I have maintained relationship and interest in him and his family and have sponsored uh, a couple of his family through school and helped his wife into a business and so on. And uh, recently, we discovered there was enormous drought. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, there's no water anywhere. We can't even flush the toilets, nothing. And I said, well, that's terrible for that to be like, well, we'll help you. So uh, we financed them to dig a well, and uh, they got a well going and got their house provided for, and people have been coming to the house. Then I asked about the church, and he said, uh, well, no, we don't have water at the church either. I said, well, you can't have a big church and no one, no water. It's just, it's just not right. And uh, so the church here, Pastor David and Kate, and, uh, uh, has released finance uh, for them to dig a well, 120 feet, 130 feet, and then to uh, um, get the pump set up and the system set up and the header tank and whatever. So I'm just going to show you pictures of it and you can just have a look at it. And John's just got a message for the church. So here it is. Here it is. Striking water. may not mean much to us because we turn a tap on for them. There's no water in this system water. Hey, 
hey, hey, hey, hey, Bay City, Pauline. Pastor Dave, Pastor Kate. I want to say thank you so much. Now we have pure green. about that this is the best water here ever and we thank God for it we thank God for it and as you can tell this is where we drilled the well the well was built here these cables these are electric cables for the pump the pump is electric pumping the water through here and then serves into the tank okay and then from the tank now this is now the outlet to the tank whereby we can now enjoy the oh, water, oh, 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 as you can see. <laughs> so, as a church, I want to say thank you very much that now we have wonderful clean water, pure water. We've been having a long period of uh, a drought period whereby water was a problem, even here in the whole city, water was a problem. But now we have pure water whereby now we are going to supply and even provide to the communities around us. So once again, I say thank you very much. I wish you can taste this water with me. See, look at that. Look at that. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Something. Thank you. And God mightly bless you. Pastor Dave, Kate, Pastor Kate, Pastor Mike. Thank you very much. Join me as we enjoy the water with me. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Isn't there something? We take it for granted. Believe me, in those countries, you can't take anything for granted. And uh, water is so essential. If you don't have water, then suddenly life changes. And uh, so I just want to thank the church for the way that through the giving and the regular giving in the church, money's been able to go there and be able to make such an amazing uh, feature for them. And so the whole community will come. It's the only place that's got water. So if you want water, you go to the church. Isn't that good? And that just, I just felt you can't have a church without water. Just it, No, we can't do that. So uh, really uh, thank Dave and Kate for making it all happen. And as you can see, there's a great joy over it all. Amen? Well, okay, I want to share with you, and we're going to, we've been talking about the kingdom of God. Haven't you been enjoying that and challenging, challenged by that and your thinking? Got lots to share, and I felt I should slow down a bit so you can take up the bits. <laughs> there's a lot to learn, and uh, I, I just have enjoyed it so much. So we've been looking at the kingdom of God, and we saw that Jesus' teaching was all about the kingdom of God. And then when you look further, further into the Bible, you discover from one end to the other, it's the story of God advancing his kingdom in the earth through family of sons and daughters. That was the original plan. The plan has never changed. And so even though Adam lost his dominion, and because of that we all have suffered, God never changed in his plan. Dominion would be restored that the kingdom would come into the earth with power and glory. It's just because you've never seen it doesn't mean it won't happen. Yeah. They had never seen a flood, but a flood happened. Right. We've never seen the kingdom come in power and glory yet. The nearest that we have in the Bible to it is in the period of King Solomon, when every nation in the earth came to Israel to hear his wisdom and see the magnificence of the kingdom of God and the presence of the glory of God there. Just a little picture of something much greater that's yet to happen. So when we look at the kingdom of God, we found uh, we had to ask the question, what is a kingdom, and then what are the attributes, or what makes a kingdom a kingdom? Because we're used to a democracy. And so we saw a number of things. We saw that a kingdom has a king. It's, a, it's the rule of a king. So when you were born again, you were born and placed at a citizen and a son or daughter in a kingdom. And a kingdom is not a democracy. A kingdom is a kingdom. It's ruled over by a king, and the king's will is done in that kingdom. The king is responsible to provide and protect. The king, the king is responsible for the welfare of his citizens. The citizens, in return, are responsible to the king to give him loyalty and allegiance and to serve him. That's how it works. So... The problem is when we just think in terms of church, we don't think kingdom. Church, we meet on Sundays and midweek. Kingdom, that's to do with how we live our life every day and how we interact with the world around us. So when you become a kingdom thinker, you become much bigger than just a small group 
meeting in a building. It's now about how I do life. It's also about what God has called me to do with my life. So therefore, it affects every area of my whole life. And so we began to look at some of the attributes of a kingdom. We saw a kingdom has a king. A uh, kingdom has a territory where the king's uh, will is done. We found that there are citizens of a kingdom. Every kingdom has citizens. If you're a citizen, you have privileges. You also have responsibilities. And uh, we saw that to become a citizen of the kingdom of God, we need to be born again. We saw in the last uh, time I did, I shared uh, a little bit on the legal system, that every kingdom has a justice system, a legal system or justice system. So when you look through the Bible at the word justice, you find it mentioned a lot in the Old Testament particularly, but you'll find that the kingdom of heaven is built, or the throne of God, his dominion is built on justice, righteousness, mercy, and truth. That's how he builds. And those are the foundations of his rule, justice, righteousness, and then mercy and truth, four pillars for his governance. And so you find in the Bible that God loves justice. Go look through the scriptures and look up the word justice, and you'll find that God delights in justice. He loves justice. And also we find that Jesus will not rest until justice has been established in the earth. So you can look at the media and see all the injustices. We experience injustices. But Jesus will not rest until justice has been set in place in the earth. So he's still working. He's still got a plan in mind. And we're part of that plan. So we saw there's a legal system. And at a practical level, we need to learn how to operate within that system. We saw also that a kingdom has a culture and it has values. In other words, value something, this is good, that's not good. This is a high value, that's a low value. And we find that the kingdom values are quite different to the values of the world around us. The world around us focuses on things which are visible, like money, position, entitlements. The kingdom of heaven focuses on unseen things, character, like wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and uh, service, humility, and character, contrary to things. It doesn't say that not to have wealth or anything like that. It just says there's a ranking of what's important. So the kingdom has values, things which are values. And Jesus taught the values of the kingdom in the Sermon on the Mount. So it has a values and it has a culture. The culture of the kingdom um, is different to much of the culture of the world. The culture of the kingdom is a culture of honor. The culture of the kingdom is a culture of serving. So if you're going to be a kingdom citizen, you learn to be a person who's able to give honor and a person who serves. That's how it is. That's what it means to live in the kingdom, what it means to be a citizen. It's to embrace the whole value system of God. How can you know someone if you don't know what he loves and what he hates? And we saw a little bit, and I didn't have time to develop it in depth, but we saw that every kingdom has an economic system. You have to have economy. You have to have resources to make things happen. And we saw that the kingdom of God has an economic system. Now, God himself doesn't need silver and gold. He says, it all belongs to me anyway. You're just a steward of it. So we understand in God's economic system, he is the source and the owner. We are the stewards. And so everything we have, we need to learn how to steward it. And so the first part of stewardship is understanding who the owner is. If you're the owner, you're responsible, you carry the weight and the stress. If God's the owner, he carries all the weight. You just learn how to manage what he's given you and become a good steward. And we saw that the economic system of God has got many facets to it. Sometimes people only hear tithing, and uh, I won't go into that, but tithing was an Old Testament pattern uh, based on the Old Covenant. In the New Covenant, we have much greater uh, insight to how uh, God's financial system work. And so it includes not just tithing and giving, it also includes things like management, saving, budgeting, investing, and legacy building. So it's much bigger than just I give a little bit of money to God. It, you kind of get, get out of a very little thinking and into God wants you to prosper so you're in a place to bless others. A poor man can't give to anyone. He needs but a person, so, so it's not a matter of how much we have, it's a matter of our whole disposition that generosity is the value of the kingdom, and even if I have little, I can be generous. How about that? Yeah. You've got nothing to do with how much you've got. You have very little, but be very generous with it. Yeah. You can have a lot and be very mean with it. 
You understand? It's not the amount you have. It's the, the money reflects the heart of the person. And some money's tight, mean money. And other money is generous money. How about that? Okay, well, I can see you starting to rattle around in my thinking there. Right? And, but you see, once you study the kingdom, you see, it changes your, your perspectives on lots of things. Okay, I want to share on another area of the kingdom. Uh, clearly, every kingdom must have an education system. Why would you need an education? What is an education system? And what is the purpose of it? Why do we need an education system? Yeah, very simple. You can't have the citizens of the kingdom remaining immature. They need to have an investment in them to develop them to their full potential. So, so, so there has to be some way you go about doing that. Now, either it's all random and you learn by trial and error, which is a very painful and uh, you suffer a lot of loss when you go down that route, or God has a way of developing us for life and service. There must be some system that God has. Every kingdom has some kind of system to invest in the citizens so they become productive because the, the people are the principal resource. Think about that. Okay. All right then, so uh, an education system is just the way, uh, a plan, it's a system, it's something organized that will give you wisdom and knowledge and understanding. That's what you want. You want wisdom, knowing what to do and when to do it. You need knowledge. You need to actually know things. Uh, you can't work without knowledge. It says without knowledge, uh, we become destroyed. So we need knowledge. You need knowledge. You need to learn things. And we uh, need to learn uh, constantly throughout life. And so in Proverbs 24, verse 3 and 4, it says, Through wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it's established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with very pleasant riches. How about that? Wisdom builds a house, understanding it's established. Knowledge the rooms are filled with precious and pleasant riches. Now, of course, the world will focus primarily on knowledge and information and skills. But God's priority is wisdom and understanding. Wisdom, I know what to do and when to do it. I make good decisions. Understanding, I see the reason. I see the root things causing things to be, and I have an insight so I can then apply wisdom. So wisdom is greater than riches and silver, because if you've got riches and silver, you can lose it if you've got no wisdom, but if you've got wisdom, you can gain riches and silver. There's a priority in the kingdom, right? It says of Jesus in Luke 2, verse 42, it says, Jesus grew. That means he changed. He grew in what? He grew in wisdom, knowing what to do, knowing God's perspective on things and what to do, and wisdom and, uh, no, and stature. That means he grew physically, and in favor with God and man. Favor is something God gives you that makes people look on you favorably and want to help you. So Jesus got wisdom, and he got favor, both with God, God's helping him out, and people are helping him out. Of all the things you want in life, wisdom and favor are the two big ones. They really are very, very big, because favor will get you all kinds of opportunities that no one else will get you. Favor will open doors for you. So the kingdom education is different to secular education. Kingdom education will educate us with eternity in mind. It educates with a long perspective. Does that make sense? In fact, if you're educated and have no understanding why you're here and what God's plan is and how it's going to unfold for eternity, you are really ignorant. It doesn't matter whether you have a PhD. I've met people with PhD and they were ignorant in terms of having a bigger perspective. They were just highly specialized in their field. But they didn't have an understanding of a bigger perspective. And most of the church doesn't either. So we, we, we want a kingdom education. We want to teach and equip children so they can have an eternal perspective and they know how to live their life and earn a living so they can be able to help others. Yeah. Think about it. Think about it. So kingdom education is based on certain things. The foundation is quite different to a secular education. Kingdom education, firstly, it is based upon the word of God is the foundation for what is true and what is not true. 
So it's got a foundation, which is the Word of God. It'll always be, we may disagree on how to interpret some aspects of it, but the Word of God is the foundation for building an eternal viewpoint. Otherwise, it's just your opinion and my opinion. The Word of God is God's view, uncovered through and progressively, as, as uh, Shane said. The second thing about a Christian education is a Christian education holds that Jesus Christ is preeminent in every arena of life. In other words, that Jesus should be, because he's the king, the center of how we view our life. So, for example, when I work with people you know, who've got into a marriage crisis, the first thing we do is just find a way to stabilize the crisis. The second thing I do is not solve the problem. Second thing I do is direct each one to Jesus Christ to see and explore their part and how this got where it got. Because if they're both connected to Jesus, putting the thing together is going to be straightforward. Does that make sense? But if you get two people and you're trying to solve their problems, oh, well, he thinks this, he said this, it's tick, 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 tick. you don't get anywhere. Because they're just trying to promote their point of view, not trying to see what God has to say about their life and conduct. And it, it unravels when I do it. I, it, it just boggles my mind when I see it happening because we start with such a mess and then gradually suddenly you see the scales fall off and they realize that the problem and how serious was never just one person causing it two have contributed to it and they're not responsible for what the other one did they're responsible for their part and when they see their part and how it's come out of their family origin, it's come out of generational curses, it's come out of wrong beliefs and viewpoints and everything and, and things in the heart, it's quite a shock to discover, actually, I got a lot to work on before they're thinking, you're the problem. Now, suddenly, when they get focused on Jesus, man, I got a lot to contribute to this mess. I've got to really get God's perspective. It's called understanding and knowing what to do about that is wisdom. That's what I do. I pray for it every day, wisdom and understanding. Understanding, ability to see what is the real root and wisdom to know what to do with it. And I've sat there over and over and over with couples and there just comes this almost like a breakthrough point when suddenly they realize that they have contributed a lot to the situation. Instead of the blame game, now what can I do? And once I got them into make Christ central, see what your part in this is, see what he wants you to do, now you can bring it together. That's what Jesus told me when I got married. I had a verse, was preached to me, two are better than one, but a threefold cord is not easily broken. And the Lord spoke to me right at that moment, I wasn't even saved, and he said, you can never make your marriage work if you don't make this a threefold cord where I am an included in your life and in your marriage. And at that point, I gave my life to Christ. At that point, I got married. And then we've been all, ever since then, working how to make Christ central and the threefold cord. Hmm? In idea. Okay. So, so it holds Christ. So also, Christian education or kingdom education is a seven, it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it's all your life. It just doesn't stop. So if you stop learning, you stop growing, and you've stagnated. <clears throat> so don't stop learning. Hunger to learn. Hunger to learn. Don't just come to a meeting, come hungry to learn something. Develop a hunger to grow and learn. Because as you look at nature, you find that all the new life is where the, where the growth is, is where all the new life and the fruit is. So you've got to be learning. What have you been learning this year that you didn't know? See, so, so here's what kingdom education does. It, it, it leads people to develop wisdom. That is, they can make good decisions. See? By connecting everything they learn to a biblical worldview. Now, one of the problems, the people have a, they, they have a secular worldview. A biblical worldview, a worldview means... The values and the, the principles that I look at life and what's going on in the world and make decisions. Now, for most people, the media is what develops their worldview. So their whole thinking about 
Israel, Middle East, Palestinians, uh, Ukraine, USA, what's going on in the world? All of it comes through media, which is corrupted and doesn't present a biblical worldview. A worldview is having a view of how all the world is working, what's causing it to happen. Like, for example, a kingdom worldview will teach you that behind all of these conflicts, including interpersonal conflicts, are invisible spiritual powers. Therefore, our war is not against people. It's against something in the invisible spirit realm. That's a worldview, not shared by people who don't know Christ. They can't understand why there's all these problems. They think if we could just make everything equal and everyone equal, we could solve it. No, it'll never solve it because it doesn't deal with the problem. It's just a man's solution. So we need a biblical worldview and we need also an understanding of, the, of an eternal uh, perspective. Where's all this going? What is all this for? Now, for many Christians, their eternal perspective is I live, I get to know Jesus, come to church, do my job, grow up, get old, die, go to heaven. That's it. Now, that's like a baby worldview. Try and find a verse that says it's God's goal to get you into heaven. All his work and all his efforts are about teaching you how to dominion on the earth. Why? If we're all going to die anyway. Because he has an eternal kingdom on the earth in mind for you to have a part to play in. And right now you're acting out your stewardship and your apprenticeship for that. Now think about this. An apprentice knows he's in training for something. He looks forward to the day he's completed his apprenticeship because on that day now he gets the big wage. Now he gets to be not the boy. Now he gets to play with the toys in the big game. You understand? It's a great thing to finish your apprenticeship. But how many Christians think of their life as an apprenticeship and preparation for a day of promotion for something much bigger? And what would that bigger thing be anyway? That's called a worldview. That's an eternal worldview where we, I understand where God is moving it all and where I fit in it, what I should do. But if you don't have that, you're just caught up with busyness and stress. And that's why so many people have the same problems as the world has. The marriages have got the same problem. The kids got the same problem. Financial, all these problems. Why all these problems? When God wants to bless you and prosper you and make you a people that stand out, it's because of lack of alignment with a kingdom worldview. Because we haven't been educated. haven't learned that. We learned something else. Went to university and got learning something else. So, so, and then the last foundation of a kingdom uh, education is it has a goal. <laughs> so, like if I, go, if I go to a music academy, my goal is to learn music on a certain instrument and the bigger picture of music and eventually graduate. Right? And so if I, if I went, went to university to do a um, uh, Master of Science in Physics, so the goal was to train in physics. Now, the one thing, this is what I learned. There are lots of things there. I thought after year one, I knew it all. I knew a lot. Year two, wait a minute, there's more. By year three, heck, I know nothing. By the time I graduated with MSc, I thought, I've just got like a pimple on a pumpkin. I know nothing compared to the big picture. This is, all my education made me realize there's a lot more I don't know. I, I, there's more I don't know than what I do know. You, you understand? So, so what is God's goal in our education? In kingdom education, what would, what would God be wanting to do? See? Make you smart, make you have money, make you gifted. With it. No, 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 no. His goal has been never changed. It's stated clearly in Scripture. His goal is the formation of sons and daughters who will share governance over the earth and its resources with him. It's never changed. So in other words, the goal of Christian or kingdom education is we are formed into mature sons and daughters. That means three things we've already seen before. Number one, that you develop a progressive, ongoing relationship which is personal and intimate with Jesus Christ. You get to know him. That, that doesn't just happen because you receive Jesus. It's like the introduction. And I can remember when I first met Joy at the university. Hello, I'm Mike. You're Joy. That was it. That's just an introduction. You know, to, 
it took a while to get it to marriage status. So, 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 so one of God's primary goals is a personal relationship with him where we get to know him, and that's going to grow on and on and on because there's more and more. I found in being married to my wife, I've had to learn lots of things, and I've had to unlearn things and learn new things. I found she's always growing and changing. I'm always having to learn. It never stops, and it never stops with God. Husbands, you'd be smart. If you think you know her, you don't. You haven't even begun to get into her world. Very complex. Men are simple. That's why they don't get it. Uh, second thing is that God is wanting to, uh, second part of sonship is the transformation of our character so we become mature like Christ. You've got to understand there's no education without character education. People don't fail because of money and skills. They fail because of character. Character, developing the life and character and heart of Christ is crucial to kingdom education. That's its goal, is to make you a mature son and daughter of God, not to keep you immature and fussing and pouting and whining and complaining and all that kind of stuff that goes on with immature people. God wants you to get past all of that and become mature. His goal is you grow up. And then thirdly, he wants a third goal of kingdom education is to prepare and develop your gifts and your passions and your attitudes for serving. So you can make a living, give to people, help people, be a blessing instead of a burden in prison. <laughs> Come on, think about it. So, so, so it's equipped, it's a con and, and all of these, are con they are continuing. So education from a kingdom point of view, you're going to be learning forever. It's a forever thing. So stop relaxing and get into a learning mode. It's going to go on forever. Okay, so add a few things to it now. So, so God will provide for everything we need for our spiritual life and maturity. He, he's provided it all because he's a father. And so here's the interesting thing, that the primary person, people responsible for a child's education is, guess what? It's the parents. Not the church, not the schools. It's the parents. Look at this. Deuteronomy 6.6. 6. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Now, you've got to understand, this comes straight after he's the, he said, here's the great commandment. What is the great commandment? Love the Lord with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself and teach your children. Teach your children. Here it is. He said, these words, what I've just said, shall be in your heart and he said, you shall teach them diligently to your children. You talk of them in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. In other words, God places not only the first commandment is about loving the Lord with all our heart, but it's also teaching the ways of God to our children. Now, that's the parent's responsibility. So it sits between father and mother. Both need to be involved. You've know, you got to see God's perspective. And he said, see, sometimes when I start to share kingdom things, you'll feel like there's a sort of a, something goes on in your head. You try to process it because it's different to what we understand. But what we're understanding has been shaped by a secular worldview and what you think normal is not God's order. You can't just dump your kids off at church and hope the church will be responsible for educating them it is not given that job. The parents are. Okay. Just putting it just where it is. That means you, have a need, you need to talk. And it says, notice it's not saying that you have some special prayer time or anything. That helps. And that's great to build a pattern of prayer in the family. But it's actually you talk about God's principles in life as things come up. You share God's perspective on how to deal with problems, with people, with life, with issues. You talk and share in a natural relational way. Okay, okay. So, but God's also supplied other resources to learn. Because you're thinking, some of you are thinking, oh, anyway, come, my parents weren't Christians, so I'm, I really bombed out, you know. No, no, that's okay. God is a father, so he provides a whole range of resources. I'm just trying to get you to see the primary one of the parents. But however, he gives us lots of other resources. So here's what Jesus said in John chapter 14. He said, I'm going away now, but I will send you a comforter 
and he will be with you and abide with you forever. He'll be in you, called the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. truth. That's what we need, truth, the Spirit of truth. So notice what he said, that I will give you a personal mentor. Now, people pay a lot for mentors. I know people, and they'll get a coach, and they'll get a mentor in sport, and they get this, and they pay them a lot of money for it. But God, through Jesus, has paid the price for you to have a personal coach. He is called the Holy Spirit. He with you every day. He's with you all the time. He knows a heap of stuff. He can help you with everything because he's smart and he's wise. He called the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of revelation. He can help you with every situation. You've got to build a connection with him and learn how to hear his voice and he'll show you what to do. And it's not like a big, heavy, hard thing. It's like developing a friend. I've got a friend with me. Now, maybe in experiences in life, people leave us and people talk about us, all that kind of stuff. But Jesus, God said, I'll never leave you. You just got to tune into him. I've got, you notice I'm driving a car out there. It's a silver Merc. You also notice my other one's gone. Now, how'd that happen? Well, I'm simple. I'm walking down the, down the prayer path. I'm doing a prayer walk. And I suddenly saw a picture of a car. 2011 Mercedes, silver, come into my head. Well, that's unusual. I'm thinking about God. Why would that come in there? And then just left it. The second day, the same thing happened. Well, that's unusual. It's interesting. God, what are you trying to say? Do you want me to do a change of car? I drove into my drive just the next day, and the guy next door, he's got a brand new, he's got a Jag there. I said, man, that's pretty fancy. Where'd you get that? And he said, oh, a collector just collected cars, died, and they sold off his car, got a great deal. Okay. So I thought, oh, well, that's great. That's, I wouldn't mind that. That would be quite good to get a collector's car, low case, and it's just been sitting there. No one's used it. That would be quite nice. You understand? I'm not praying or anything. Just... And then I went to Auckland, and a friend up there just gave me a little cup. He said, oh, are you interested in this? He said, look down in Hamilton there. There's this 2011 Merc. It's a silver Merc. It's been a collector's item. The collector died, and it's just there for sale. It's only got 16,000 kilometers on it. I went down and I said, I'll buy it. Now, normally you don't buy cars that way, but I do lots of things differently. <laughs> Other people take ages to do it. I just do it like that on some things because I got insight from God. And so I didn't have to stop to think about the other car. Just the desire for it left me immediately. And I thought, this is what God wants me to have right now. This is God's provision. Here it is. It's just happened. Drove it away just like that. Guy was quite shocked. They're just not used to people behaving that way. But what you see, it's the Holy Spirit coming into daily life to teach us, instruct us. I don't have to do months of search online to find the answer. I can't be bothered with that. I've got other more important things to do. God just drops the things into me. And then sometimes he'll stretch stuff out that takes me ages and a bit of pain in it. So number one, the Holy Spirit. See? So... Uh, secondly, the Word of God. God gives you His Word. Now, the Bible, you say, oh, I can't understand it. Well, get someone to teach you and help you understand it and show you how to read it and get a simple version. Start reading it. Just get a simple version. Start reading a simple version that, that's going to be easy to read. And just and don't worry about the stuff you don't know. Ask Jesus to show you and help you with the stuff you do know and d put it into practice. And then you'll learn more. Because we kind of wait, well, I want to know it all. No, no, you know. Just do what you're called to do with what you know and you'll get more. That's how it works. So study the Word of God. Everyone who's a kingdom citizen reads the Word of God regularly because that's the manual on how the kingdom operates. Uh, the third thing God does is, he, and here it is, 2, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and how to live rightly, so the man of God may be mature. Completely equipped for every good work. So it says the Word of God is the tool God has given you to get you so you can do life well. Yeah. You've got to study it. And if it's hard, well, of course, study is hard. It takes a bit of effort and commitment, but the, the rewards are great. You become mature. You get to know how to make things happen. So you get to understand God. Here's the third thing that God gives us to help us in our journey to maturity and to grow is he gives us a learning community. He places us in a church. Now, church is not, now, you've got to get out a religious concept. Church is actually a community of people with God at the center. Yeah. And, and we're called to worship God and to equip and, and build people for service. So, so God places us in a local church. These days, you can get access online if you can't get all the resources in the local church. But there's, notice here in Ephesians 4.16, God wants us in a community, a learning community. 
the whole body, joined together and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effect of working. Every part does its share and the whole body grows. So part of the way you grow is being connected into people that are growing. And not just ordinary people, but God's people. And you honor the church, honor the community. You say, well, you don't know all the problems in there. Man, you don't understand. I know the problems. I know things you don't know. Problems that would make your hair stand on end. But that doesn't mean that it's not God's plan to put us in a community to learn and grow how to love people. Otherwise, you just choose the nice people you like and hang out with them. I mean, God puts you in a community. I don't even like them. There they are. They're in my group. Is there another group, a better group, you know? It's like that's, that, this is what goes on in our head. But you've got to stop that. You realize that God puts you with people you wouldn't normally connect with. So you learn to grow and become mature and love people and celebrate differences. Educate God's perspective. Not like our one, you see. We like to get in our own little club with people we like. And, uh, so, and, and here's another thing that God, God, God gives fivefold ministries. Now, now, God gives you a gift. You all have gifts. But, he gives, but the ministry, a fivefold ministry, they don't just turn up on trees, you know. They take a long time to grow to get the person where they can do what God wants them to do. They've got to go through a lot of God's processing to be able to become a person who can equip others. Many don't make it. They quit on the way. So when, when someone's a fivefold ministry gift, an apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, teacher, then they are experienced and they are seasoned by the work of God in their life. See, so therefore, God gives them to you to equip you and mature you, grow you up. That's what I'm doing right now. This is my role, is to equip people. People want me to come and just come pray for you and fix their problems. No, I won't do that. I want you to show how to fix your problems, how to stand up, how to get authority back in your life. I want you to be equipped. It, it, this is, it's a different, different perspective altogether. Get the idea? So we need the equipping. We need the equipping of the fivefold ministries. And then he gives us, of course, life experiences. Romans 8, 28, we know all things work together for good, who love God and who are called in his purpose. So God gives you all of these things to equip you. So some of the experiences that you're complaining and burdened and weeping or whatever, they're to equip you. If you lean into Christ and learn how to deal with those issues, that experience will take you from one level of maturity to another because you overcame it. So when there's problems in their life, there are opportunities to overcome and prevail and be able to bless others. They're equipping opportunities. And God's got them all engineered for every one of us. And even the dumb things we do that mess up, even even those experiences, when we humble ourselves and admit that we, we blew it, then we can learn from it. So there's always learning. How about that? So what about public schools? Where do they fit in the education plan of the kingdom? Well, they don't. They just don't. Now, we could go on a tangent, but I'll just throw a few things out. God is ne- Try and find a verse in the Bible where God authorized any government to educate the people. It's given to the church and the, fa- and the parents. See? Here's, here's the second thing is, a government education system will develop a secular worldview which is in, co- in, in conflict with the worldview you're trying to build in the home. It's okay if they send them to a government school. You've just got to understand that there is a conflict of worldviews, conflict of values. And it's in the, in the era that we're in, which is post-Christian, and there's a rejection of the Bible as a basis for morality, there is the entrance into our education system of a, not only a worldview, but values which are absolutely hostile to biblical values. And you've got your children there all these hours a day getting exposed to all of that. What are you doing at home to input to them and shape their thinking? See, we can't do it in one hour out the back. You you can't fix it up. You can't fix a problem that big up. You you just can't do it. You can create encounters and opportunities and, and many wonderful things, but you can't fix what is fundamentally a parental issue. Okay? So the other thing is through education in government schools is usually disrupted quite frequently by students from broken families and uh, personal behavior issues. It's a big problem for teachers. This is the reality of it. Now, 
you, you can't change what's there. You, you've got to decide. You decide the children are in there. Then you've got to make sure your position as a parent to engage with the children about what's going on in their life. So uh, in a secular education system, some of the issues that affect children may be concealed intentionally from the parent. So if a child gets pregnant, a child has gender issues or identity issues or struggling or even being bullied, often the school will not let the parents know. This is becoming an increasing trend. In other words, things that are important to your child are concealed by the people entrusted with them. It's just, I'm not bagging anything, we're just looking at what's going on. And so you understand that you need to, the home needs to be the source and center of Christ and Christian values. You cannot leave it to someone else to do it. You know the idea? And so Christian parents need to monitor what's going on at school and keep an eye on your children and any changes taking place in your children because you can become very trusting about what's going on and not realize there is a philosophy and worldview which will actually take them off course. Now, it's just living in, called living in the world. Daniel lived in, in Babylon and and he was in that kind of culture, and because of his heart dedication to the Lord, God gave him wisdom above everyone else. He was the smartest guy in the school, in other words. So we don't need to be afraid of this. You just need to be aware of it and realize that a heart consecration of the parents and children to Christ and to living out God's ways will actually be the biggest and best remedy to all of this. Okay. You're getting real quiet on that. Well, let's go into something else then. <laughs> How many know that God wants you to mature? God wants you to mature. Jesus taught on it, and it's all, it's all the way through the Bible. And uh, so Paul taught on it, Colossians 1.28. He said, my whole work is to present people mature when Christ comes. So in other words, his whole thing is, I want people to grow up. I want you all to grow up. And uh, John taught on it. He wrote in 1 John chapter 2, verse 13, and he said, there are some who are fathers, there are some who are young men, and there are some who are children. That speaks of different stages of maturity. If you're a babe and a child, that's fine. Just grow up. If you're a young man, that's fine. Also grow up. If you're a father, do the work of a father and care for others and help them. You understand? So there's levels of maturity. Everyone is called to grow in their maturity. Uh, Hebrews speaks about it in Hebrews 6.1, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Let us all go on to maturity if God will let us. Now, anyone who's been around church for a while will realize Many Christians have been there for years and are not mature. They are unable to grow up because certain foundations are not established. That's why they're not growing. And you've got to understand what they are, and then you can grow. And so I don't want to be around and just recycling the same problem this year as I did 10 years ago. That's something's wrong when you're... You've got the same issue now that you've had for years. You've never dealt with it. You've never matured in that area. So everyone, what, so here's a question then. In this year, 2024, what is God speaking to you about growing up in? Oh, I don't know. Well, then listen. Ask him where he wants you to grow. Ask your spouse where you need to grow. Be easy to ask God, actually, but actually just... Your spouse is designed to tell you. After you've gotten over that, then you can go and do work on it, all right? <laughs> so, so, so what does spiritual maturity be? So a lot of people think, well, I know a lot of the Bible. I'm mature, I'm really wise. Blah, blah, blah. No, no, lots of people know lots of the Bible, and they're absolute idiots. They just, it's just like, hello, knowing the Bible doesn't make you mature. It means you know the Bible. You read it a lot. And, and, and so, well, I went to lots, of, go to lots of meetings. No, no, that doesn't make you mature. It means you go to lots of meetings. You don't have no time for anything else. And, well, you go to lots of premiums and praying all the time. No, that doesn't make you mature. It, it, can you understand? These things don't make you mature. It, what, what maturity is about is the formation of your character and attitudes towards God and people. Yeah. It, it's a shift internally of, of your whole thinking. So maturity means you, you are developing progressively to become more like Christ in your attitudes and your lifestyle, the way you treat people. 
There's a development there. So if you're still irritable and cranky and you've been that way for years, you're not growing. You should do something about that. Shouldn't you? <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to remain there to teach us how to be more loving. And <laughs> You're the irritant that helps us grow. I don't want to be the irritant that helps people grow. I want to help people grow by showing them what to do, not be the irritant that causes them frustration and they have to seek God to overcome and grow. That's why pastors have had to grow. <laughs> okay, so there's some, there's, let me give you five things then. I'll quickly finish this now. Five things that are, that are essential to growing or maturing as a believer. So maturing as a believer means I'm steadily changing in my internal character and way I relate and do life to be more like Jesus would do it. That's really simple. Just focused on Jesus. Just be, well, he is. Okay, and we could put it in specific things. But here's a few key things. Number one, you need to actively pursue your relationship with the Lord. Why? Because there's nothing like an encounter with God to bring about quick change. So you, you've got to pursue that relationship. It's not just knowing Bible verses, it's encountering Him. So in Ephesians 3 verse 8, uh, Paul talks about, I, and now everything I've got in my life I counted as nothing compared to the excellence of knowing Him. When you get, the more you know Jesus, the more you get to love Him, the more He becomes central to your heart and affections. Doesn't mean you ignore everything else, it's just there's a refocusing of your life that brings out the best in you. See, in verse uh, 14, he says, I press on for the goal of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. And anyone who would like to be mature, let him have this attitude. So you notice then he's saying, if you want to be mature, make it your goal to press on and grow in knowing who Jesus is, what he's like, what he values, what, how he operates, how he works, all those kind of things. We want to know him. And uh, he talks then about a prize to be won. Now, what's at stake is the, the honor and reward of participating in the first resurrection and sharing dominion in his coming kingdom. Now, I'll share on that in a later session when I talk about, remember, every kingdom has an honor system and reward system. The kingdom of God has an honor system and reward system that acknowledges what you have done, and what you've become. So, for example, how many of you were mentioned in the honours list on Queen's birthday, or King's birthday? How many got their name? Why did we not get our name there? We didn't qualify. We just didn't qualify. Now, you understand that at the coming of the kingdom, there's honours and rewards for which you must qualify. So I don't like that. I want us all to be equal. I'm sorry, he doesn't like that. Why? Why would you respond to someone who's sacrificially given their life, served and given over and, and been generous and put on the life of Christ? Someone else just come to church whenever they want, go and do whatever they want. Is it not the same? They're, they're stay, now, in terms of value to God, they're equal. In terms of value to the kingdom, oh, they're really quite different. In terms of honor that they qualify for, oh, really quite different. You understand it's the justice of God that he rewards those who faithfully serve him. That's what justice looks like. And Paul says, if by any means I might attain to the out from resurrection. He's not talking about the general resurrection. He's talking about the first of two resurrections. The first one, when the kingdom of God comes, when Christ comes, that is a resurrection of reward that we are now qualifying or disqualifying for. Mm. It's quiet when we talk about that kind of thing. Okay, so, and then the second thing is, we need, if we want to become mature, we need to be open to being equipped in our personal life by ministries God has sent. So, Ephesians 4 11, we've seen, they're given for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So, we need a pastors, we need evangelists, we need prophets, we need apostles, we need teachers. So, a, a, a balanced church will bring in all kinds of ministries so that we're experiencing the feel and the flavor, and it affects our life. 
See? So an evangelist will bring forth evangelism. So Trent uh, was here, Pastor Trent, last weekend as an evangelist. You get so many people get saved. How did that happen? You just told stories. You get different people, and they, they, it seems easy when they do it because they are gifted in that area to equip and, and, and bring a passion into us for souls. And, and uh, other, other ministries do different things. So we need exposure to those ministries. Thirdly, we need to be established in the foundational teachings of Christ. Now, there are some foundations you need to be established in. That means understand them and live with them operating in your life. If you don't live with them operating in your life, you can't grow. You just keep recycling. Same old things. And in, in the writer in Hebrews says that he says, now let's not, in Hebrews 5, he says, now don't, let's not remain immature like some are, and you've got to keep feeding them milk. We want to give them some solid teaching. You can't give them solid teaching. They're like babies that need milk. See, so some people, solid teaching means that we're teaching the principles of the kingdom, the realities of the coming kingdom and God's plan. Elementary teaching, hey, God loves you. Jesus forgave you. died on the cross for your sins. Now, that is what's called elementary. It's essential teaching. For babes, you've got to give them that. But you don't stay there. You've got to grow. And you grow by hungering for and growing. Now, so what are the, the key foundations? They're found in Hebrews chapter 6. And it says in verse 1, it's leaving the elementary teaching about Christ. Let's press on to maturity. So who's responsible to press on? We are. It's our responsibility to press on. And, and not laying again the foundation. So a foundation is what you build your house on. A foundation of repentance from dead works of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of eternal of resurrection from the dead, and eternal judgments. These are what you call foundational understandings that give a worldview. So the first ones get you established. Repenting from dead works, lifeless activities that are not inspired by God and have no value. Faith towards God, leaning into and learning how to build a relationship of trust in God. The doctrine of baptisms, that we are baptized into a body. We belong to the body of Christ now. The water baptism, meaning that my old life is gone, I've got a new start. And baptism in the Holy Spirit, I can now live a new life in the realm of the Spirit. The laying on of hands, that I need people to impart to me the gifts of God and activate the gifts of God to release the power of God into my life. That's a part of the foundational teaching. Resurrection from the dead includes two resurrections. One, that all will be raised from the dead, some for punishment, some for life. But prior to that, the first resurrection, resurrection of reward preceding Christ ruling on the earth for a thousand years. And then eternal judgments. So eternal judgments have to do with how God deals with us. And so if we've come to Christ, we are saved. God deals with us as a son and a daughter, not in terms of were we saved or not saved. He's dealing with us now on the point of view of what can I entrust to you on the basis of how you lived your life. Oh, it's getting really quiet now. Well, these are just basic things, see? So it's our personal responsibility to read the Word of God and inquire and study and learn these things. It, it, it's, your, it's your responsibility to hunger to learn. It's your responsibility to hunger and seek God. It's your responsibility to be open, to be taught. It's your, because how else are you going to grow? And, and then finally, the last couple, we need to embrace personal transformation. We need to actually welcome changing That's it. people like the idea of it rather than the reality that would mean uh, what it would mean for us uh, was that we need to be open that maybe I need healing in my heart and life because of some of the trauma experiences I've gone through maybe I need deliverance because my life is tormented and bound in ways that stop me growing see maybe I need to work on my character and my heart attitudes Maybe I need to learn how to obey God's word instead of just doing what I feel all the time. And, and, and maybe I need to develop knowledge and skills. I mean, among some of the Pentecostals, they just, it's like there's a, there's a reaction to knowledge and skills and development for life. But in the kingdom, 
we see that God has invested in you passions and, and the desires and skills. Your responsibility is to invest in their development. So how are you going to mature if you won't do that? That's your job. It's your responsibility to learn those things. How about doing that? How about making a situation this year you'll, you'll embrace growth? And then finally, the last way that we grow, or one of the key things that helps us grow, is having great relationships, healthy relationships. Here's the scripture, and it's found in Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. So what you need are not friends that will agree with your problems and complaints. They are not friends. They are actually undermining your growth and maturity. What we all need are people who have gone a bit further than us or a bit higher than us. We feel uncomfortable around them, but they inspire us to come up. So normally in our relational area, we'll have some we're helping and serving, some are our peers, and some are helping us do life better, grow and mature and shift and change. You need all of those people in your life, but you specifically need ones that will pull you up. So you've got to find them. Because lots of people agree with you about your complaints and negativity and you feel comfortable there, you never change. But when you get around people who are greater level of authority, greater walk with God, greater knowledge of the Word, greater prayer life, the moment you're with them, you start to feel uncomfortable because you're in the process of becoming aware of your need to grow. And iron sharpens iron. So you get with people, some people, you walk away and you are energized, alive. There's been a flow of inspiration. That's what the small groups are meant to be like. Not just come there and suck the life out of it with needs. That really is immature. It's to come and contribute to the building of one another. And as we... As we grow in our relationship with the Lord and then as we let Him work in our life to change us, He wants us to be involved in the work of building others and serving Him in whatever arena He's called us to do it. And all of those things affect one another. The relationship with God brings some change. Working with people brings change. Change brings change. So, so God wants us to grow. He has a, a plan in place with a goal in mind and he wants you to commit to the process of growing. So the challenge this year is, where do you need to grow? Are you waiting around for someone to make that happen magically? Or are you making decisions to invest in yourself? Study, mentoring, small group, part of a team. I mean, I love it. People get in the team and they learn things. I would never, I've never learned. How to do all their video thing. Children come out of church these days. They know things that no one else knew at their age. Because they've been involved in serving, they grew. Learn how to be part of a team. They grew. Learn how to take direction. They grew. Learning how to be corrected. They grew. Learning how to develop skills. They've grown. You understand the church is a community to grow us. So where do you need to grow this year? Walk with God area of your personal life and character or just in the area of skills and involvement in serving people? Where do you need to grow? Perhaps it's in your marriage. Perhaps it's in your parenting. Perhaps it's in being a father. Perhaps it's being a mother. Well, it's not just going to happen. I turned to church and I prayed to Jesus. No, no, come on, invest in it. Buy a book. Get some reading. Find someone. And, and go to someone who has got experience in that. I don't understand Christians. And they went to the wrong person for their advice. What is that about? If you want advice in fathering, find someone who's a really good father and has got fruit in his children and ask them for advice. If you want financial advice, don't go to someone with no money and is in debt. They can't help you. They need someone to help them. You know, if, if you want to build a good marriage, go to someone who's got a good marriage and ask, what are the keys? What were the struggles you had? What were the things that gave you the breakthrough? And learn. You want to grow somewhere in a skill? Find a great musician and ask them to mentor you and then honor them and sow into them for doing it. Yeah. You, you, this, is how, this is how the kingdom brings growth. So don't stay where you are. 
Don't let a year go by and you're the same as you were last year. Don't do that. Make a decision this year. I am growing. I am gaining education in the kingdom to be useful to my Father. We say that? Why don't we close our eyes? Why don't you just all stand right now as we come to the end of stand? Maybe there's some here who need to make a response to Jesus. Greatest thing you could do today would be to open your life and make a start in the journey with God. Start in a journey of the kingdom of God in your life. That requires a res- response to Jesus. You could make that decision today to receive Jesus. Open your heart and life and have Him in. I'm just going to give an invitation and a moment for people to come forward. If God is speaking to you today. If you need to receive Christ to make the first step to be in the kingdom of God, just make your way to the front. Come up here and stand in the front. I'll lead you through a prayer to do that. Perhaps there's others and you're needing a breakthrough in an area of your life and you say, God, I'm stuck. Help me. Give me a breakthrough. Come up in the altar call there. Perhaps there's an area of healing needed. Perhaps there's an area you need to be freed in your life. Perhaps there's something in your character. You say, God, today I'm coming forward to surrender it to you. And then afterwards, I'm going to learn and get help in that area. I'll sign up for a course. I'll come along to something. I'll look around for what will help me grow in that area. Why don't we just flow into a song now as we do that. Those of you who want to come to the front right now, make your way now to the front. Let's come. Let's come. You want to come to Jesus? Come now. Thank you, dear. Just come now. Come now if you want to receive Jesus Christ. Want to give your life to Him? Just come. God bless. God bless. Good on you. Others today needing something in your life. You need a breakthrough. You're stuck. Make your way to the Lord. Make your way. Come. Just come. Come right now. God bless. Any others today? You need a breakthrough in your life? Perhaps there's something you need freedom from? Perhaps you're struggling with anxiety and fear. You say, God, I really want to have that fear broken off my life. Perhaps you've been struggling with confusion, mental confusion. You say, God, I want that broken off my life today. Perhaps you're here and you're struggling and you're tormented in your thought life. There's thoughts go on about who you are that continue to judge you and you say, I need breakthrough in that area. Just come, come, come now. That's right, make your way to the front and come. Lord, we honor you. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your grace. We thank you, Lord, you care about us. Come on, let's worship him. We honor you, Lord. We bless you. What a privilege to be in your kingdom. Let your kingdom come. Let your presence come and touch us. Are there any others need to come? Want to make a response to the Lord today? Just make your way to the front. Perhaps you need healing in your body. Need a breakthrough in your life. You say, Jesus, I'm coming to you. Thank you, Lord. We have our ministry team just come and just pray with people. Lord, we honor you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Did any of you come to give your life to Jesus? There's one and who are two. Okay, then. And it's just to close your eyes, everyone. Let's pray a prayer with me. Prayer is just talking to God. When we talk to Him and we mean what we say, He responds. Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to you. So when I come believing God hears me, believing He will respond, heaven opens up and God begins to touch my life. So I want us all just to pray a simple prayer. It's called the sinner's prayer. It's a prayer that makes a way for us into the presence of God. Just follow me in this prayer. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose again from the dead. Lord, I come to you today. I repent of all my sins. I ask you to forgive me, to accept me. I receive by faith forgiveness. I receive by faith your spirit into my heart. 
and I give my life to you. Today I belong to you. I'm a child of God, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, and you will be with me forever. Thank you, Jesus, for responding to me. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let's give him a clap. Thank you, Lord. you um, if you haven't signed up for the business seminar next Friday uh, come and see me if you have signed up but haven't paid please do so because the door will be closed <laughs> and uh, next Sunday is going to be fantastic as well God bless you love you heaps